Welcome to Tokyo, the bustling capital of modern Japan and epicentre of the world's third biggest economy. I'm Tim Harcourt, the airport economist, and I'm going to show you how to do business in this amazing country. Whether you're in town to do a deal, set up an office or tap the local consumer. We're going to learn from Tokyo's top business gurus, find out how you can start selling to the local market and chat to businesses profiting from Japan's new approach to the world. I first came here to Tokyo as a four-year-old to live with my family, just before Japan became the economic superpower it is today. Japan is dynamic, fast and efficient, like the bullet trains that connect business around the country. Come with me and let's find out what makes Japan tick. Japan is located in North Asia, off the coast of the Koreas and Russia. It's made up of almost 7,000 islands. It has 14 cities with a population over 1 million people. Greater Tokyo alone is home to a whopping 38 million. Like its famous sumo wrestler, Japan is big. It's the world's third largest economy and 26th biggest when it comes to per capita income. With a population over 127 million, that makes it a very rich country too. After decades of no growth, the Japanese economy has been expanding by almost 1% a year since 2010. Inflation remains low and the unemployment rate is 3.5%. Japan is a global business hub. 55 of the Fortune Global 500 companies have their headquarters in Japan, putting it in third place after the US and China. It's ranked number one in the world for business sophistication, gets more research funding than any other country, and has the most Nobel Prize winners in Asia. It's safe to say when you come to Japan, you're dealing with an advanced workforce and a savvy consumer. Japan is also an ageing society. Around 22% of the Japanese population is over 65, and this is expected to rise to 40% by 2060. It has low birth rates, low rates of female labour force participation, low immigration and a gender imbalance. It's running out of husbands. One of the world's largest economies has returned to growth and is back in business. I'm going to show you why now is a great time to get in on the action and put Japan on your company's radar. Invest Japan, or Jetro, runs business support centres in Japan's major cities. It offers a range of free services to help you set up in Japan, from helping you through government procedures to connecting you with tax and legal experts to matching you with partners. You get your own consultant to guide you through the process and access to free office space at their business centres. Creating a trust base between Japanese partners or customers are vital in this market. For that sake, when you think to come to the Japanese market, I recommend to place your kind of existence in Japan first. I mean, uh, place your staff in Japan or create your office in Japan first. And for that sake, uh, we are happy to help you. Blackmores is a major play in the health supplements market in Asia, but only a recent entrant into Japan. Let's hear about the company's local strategy and the help they've received from Jetro and other organisations along the way. So how did you engage with government agencies and trade organisations in the Japanese market? Since we don't have our own legal entity set up yet in Japan, uh, so we got a great support from Australia and Jetro uh, from Japan to our team in Australia and also Asia. We have great programs designed by Australia where we are, we, our CEO and our Asia director met with the key partners in Japan and, and really good follow-up. And uh, since then, we have been embarking our journey in Japan. How do you sell to the Japanese consumer? Who, who buys your products? We started with a, we call it a, a soft launch in Japan via Amazon. So the e-commerce is actually easier to start with. And then uh, we have some of the key products like the glucosamine and then the uh, multivitamin selling to the uh, more active consumers. And are, are Japanese customers embracing foreign products like Blackmores? They are, they are. I think especially for the young generation who has more of exposure from internet and also traveling, uh, they're definitely more open and ready to try the uh, quality new products from overseas. So the Japanese market's notoriously quite difficult to get into. What advice would you have for other exporters trying to get into the Japanese market? Always be humble, take nothing for granted. Uh, I think for any Western company coming to Asia and Japan, the culture is different. You always have to learn the local cultures and practice. Good partners is extremely important in Japan. So I uh, talk to like the party side Austria, uh, meeting with good distributors. Don't take assumptions into the market. Just unlearn your habits and go to learn. Japan laid the groundwork for the Asian century long before China came on the scene. In just a couple of remarkable decades, Japan transformed from ruins to Asia's powerhouse, taking the region to the world. The rise of post-war Japan is one of the great stories of modern economic history. Whole cities were flattened in World War II, and Japan pulled itself out of the rubble 
and built one of the most successful business cultures we've seen. It made peace with the West and transformed into a vital economic partner for the likes of Australia, the US, the UK and Europe. Its companies invested heavily in economic development and their capital and know-how propelled the region. Japanese companies like Toyota, Honda and Sony became household names from Sydney to San Francisco. I experienced this development firsthand as a child, taking one of the first bullet chains, the Shinkansen, to the Osaka Expo of 1970. Japan was unable to sustain the spectacular growth of the 1960s and 70s. From the early 90s, it suffered from deflation and two decades of little or no growth. The country's ageing population didn't help. To kickstart the economy, Prime Minister Abe introduced Abenomics, with his three arrows to give Japan a jolt in the arm to get back on the growth train. And they're slowly working. A new Japan has emerged from the lost decades. Social demographics have changed as the society ages, rural towns disappear, and the gender gap widens. This traditionally insular market is also looking overseas for alternative products and partnerships. Let's find out what this means for your business. Grant Thornton's Richard Gropetta is a true Japan expert, living and breathing the country for over 20 years, literally. He says Japan's new generation are very strong business people. So the decision making in Japan has become a lot quicker. There is still the need for consensus in a Japanese company, but what you find is the new economy of Japan, if you can call it that, is a lot more agile. And would you say that Japan is now more open to overseas products? Yes, certainly. And overseas partnerships? 20 years ago, you couldn't enter Japan unless you had a partnership. Now it's a lot more easier. Government's been focused around a concept of internationalization opening the doors for foreign companies to operate there. Foreign GDP, for example, of the Tokyo economy is a bit over 15%. That is a big part of the local market. So the idea of entering the market as a foreigner is a lot more accepted and a lot more easier to do. And when doing business in Japan in the domestic economy, yep. how does a place like Tokyo differ from, say, if you're doing business in Osaka? Yes. Or Sapporo in Hokkaido? Yeah, when it comes to doing business in Tokyo, it is a global market and you would treat it as if you were doing business in somewhere like New York, London to an extent. It's very big, very big market. It's the home of decision makers. When working in somewhere like Osaka or Sapporo, it's very much a local business and it's a lot more domestic in feel. Keep in mind, most decision making in Japan now is done in Tokyo. So even if the headquarters might be in Osaka, you'll find that the sales office or the buying office will be in Tokyo. Now you have a lot of experience in doing business all around Asia in your role. Do you think doing business in Japan is unique? Japan is unique in that if you had to compare Asia to maybe the EU, look at the Japanese in a similar way of doing business with Germans or Swiss, uh, being very much uh, around detail, structure, and very organised. And the great thing about the economy or doing business in Japan is if you too are organised and detailed in your approach, you'll find a quite a nice receptive response from Japanese business partners. And how important are strategic alliances, joint ventures, partnerships in doing business yeah, in Japan? Yeah, very good. The Japanese business environment is all about relationships and it's all about cross shareholding. So going into an alliance with a Japanese company provides access to all their alliances as well rather than trying to start from scratch one by one, by partnering with a strong Japanese company, what you'll find is that you're buying into their alliances immediately. What are your key tips for doing business in Japan? First one is be humble. Humble and listen. So when you're visiting Japan, doing business, when you show humility, that you'll gain a greater reception from your counterparts. The second thing would be focus on the relationship first. And remember that they're not looking at you for your returns and looking at if you're someone you can do business with. So humility, relationships. The third part is remember that uh, a lot of the Japanese market is around market share. So if you design your business plan to be around helping create market share, you'll find greater reception as well. They're probably the three keen tips. You can add a fourth, patience. Go to theairporteconomist.com for more of Richard's extended interview. Next up, we will look at the nuts and bolts of investing in Japan, whether you're a startup or a multinational. We'll also chat with Australia Post and find out how you can get your product over here and start exporting to Japan. Over 100 million savvy consumers with money to spend. Sounds like the ideal place to start doing business. But how do you actually make it happen? 
Let's find out how to get your product over here and the best ways to sell it. Japan has a reputation for being ordered, but with that comes some thorough regulations, especially on products coming into the country. Most imports are subject to strict duties and taxes, averaging around 5% of shipping value, but up to 30% on some products. Online shopping is growing rapidly, but only 40% of consumers have bought from overseas. If you want to succeed in online shopping in Japan, you have to get your goods over here and sell it on Rakuten, the local equivalent of Amazon. There's a whopping 80 million online shoppers in Japan and most have a Rakuten account. They're buying everything from groceries to fine wines to cosmetics and healthcare products like vitamins. I sat down with Ben Franzi from Australia Post to find out how you can start selling your products online in Japan. Once you're on Rakuten, you're actually only competing with other Rakuten merchants. And we do know Japanese consumers are very loyal to Rakuten. At the same time, they also tend to spend more money on Rakuten. So they have a higher transaction rate and a higher transaction fee. But there are a couple of disadvantages of selling on Rakuten. Shipping cost is one. So if you're an Australian merchant trying to sell into Japan on Rakuten, you are competing with local domestic players in Japan. So shipping costs can add to the overall cost of your product. The second is cultural differences. You need to understand the Japanese market and it is in Japanese. At Australia Post, we've seen our volumes to Japan grow by about 20% year on year. We also know that the Japanese market tends to buy local, but they are at the moment about 12% of the time, they tend to buy from overseas. So it is tipped to grow from an overseas cross-border perspective. Vet Products Direct is an Australian e-tailer that's been selling vet products online around the world since the late 90s, with the assistance of Australia Post. It targets a niche market of Japanese pet owners seeking overseas products. It's chosen to stay away from Rakuten and sells through its own Japanese language online shop. I asked General Manager Mike Woodrow how Vet Products Direct got into the Japanese market. The early response we had from Japan perhaps led us to believe that this was going to be a pot of gold. On closer investigation, what we found is it's a, a very independent market, quite a closed market. That's continued for us to be a quite a profitable market, a very loyal market, but it feels like there, there is a ceiling there or there's, there's certainly some barriers to entry. Is there cultural issues with packaging, with Japanese language you think that might affect you? Our observation would be that to be a player, a serious player in that market, would require a Japaneseification of, yes. of Vet yeah. Products Direct, probably a local presence, a significant local partnership. And at the time, it has been our strategic position to not do that. So we could see that there was huge opportunity there. We could also see there was a, a fair bit of risk there. Um, perhaps Japan, like no other Asian market, we need, we need to play on their terms and their terms are quite strict. And so is it online, vending machine, bricks or mortar? How do you go into Japan? Our strategy has been to go cautiously and to use a very safe medium, which is, uh, which is the online space. And every time we've tried to step outside that, um, the risk has... Um, it's been one that strategically we've chosen not to take, which doesn't mean that would be the same decision for anyone who looked at Japan. How do you get your products over to Japan physically? So we're very fortunate in, in that most of our products are small, mm. so they're quite compact, mm. um, reasonable value to them, and they're consumable. So if you're online, that, those are the three things you're really looking for. So most of what we send will go into a shoebox, and so it's it's either satchels, parcels, or very small boxes. And so Australia Post has always been our preferred conduit, um, both to Japan and all of our international markets. You can find more tips from Australia Post on our website. With a spate of new free trade agreements and Arbonomics in full swing, could now be the time to get back into Japan. I spoke with one of the region's leading telecommunications companies about entering this mature market. Uh, Japan is very mature and uh, more developed than other Asian countries. Japan is more uh, bureaucratic, a lot of uh, rich history and a lot of traditional way. So I think that's a big difference from other countries. How do you actually break into the Japanese market? Are there certain barriers to entry? Absolutely. Uh, language is most important challenge for foreign companies. The Japan market is a very tough market. Actually, it is not so easy to break into and uh, penetrate because of um, quality is very sensitive. 
most of senior people care very much about quality of services. And for young generation, they care much about cost and performance. So despite the headlines, you think Japan's back as a player in Asia? I believe so. Japan is one of the most welcoming cultures you'll find anywhere in the world. But there are certain protocols you must follow if you want to succeed in business here. Take the time to understand how Japanese partners and customers think and operate so your message doesn't get lost in translation. You don't have to be an expert in Japanese language on your first trip, but body language is important. Learning how to bow is crucial. It shows respect and trust. It dates back to the samurai days when showing someone the nape of your neck was a sign of trust. You must respect seniority in Japan. Take time to discover company hierarchy and observe that in business dealings, respect your elders. Be punctual and polite at all times. Japanese business environments are very formal during working hours. Socialising comes after dark. Like most Asian cultures, building trust in relationships is crucial. In Japan, entertaining clients or customers is part of the deal. Do accept an invitation and have fun, but remember, you haven't clocked off. Pace yourself, any blunders will be hard to laugh off the next day. There's a big gift-giving culture in Japan and lots of emphasis on presentation. A key ring or a few beer coasters from home won't cut it, I'm afraid. And then there's the food, fresh, clean and healthy. No wonder everyone lives so long in Japan. Let's get a lesson in Japanese dining and cuisine from the Grand Hyatt in Tokyo. And are there particular protocols or customs when you eat out in, in Japan? There are. I think the thing that I've found is to cue off of the host and the tone that they will set for the evening, uh, from small things to having your chopsticks in front of you in this angle, and also being able to understand that um, as you refresh drinks, you wait for someone else to pour that for you. If you happen to be the one refreshing, you're sensitive to pour for everyone else. I think there's a sense of formality or informality that will be a part of the dining experience depending on where you are. So what are the districts around Tokyo where you can take people to dine? Oh, they're so diverse. Um, between Shibuya, Shinjuku, our area of Roppongi Hills and the Marinucci and the area around Tokyo Station, radiating out from there, there's every type of dining you can imagine. What's the best form of transport in Tokyo? You know, taxis are available everywhere. The drivers are very kind, the equipment very clean, and they have a great deal of pride in their work. The train system is punctual and it is clean and safe. We find that walking is wonderful. You can spend time doing it either way, which takes you from the busyness of the city into the quietness of the surrounding neighborhoods. And what would be your, your top three tips for foreign businesses in Japan? I think as they come in and, and they're here, it's to be sincere, to listen, and to process the environment you're in, to read the air, if you will and understand how the communication may be coming back to you. Also to be very respectful and understanding that opinions are diverse and that everyone makes decisions at a different speed. Businesses of all shapes and sizes can succeed in Japan. Let's give you a bit of inspiration. South Australian organic skincare company Jeunesse has been exporting to Japan for 20 years. It maintains a traditional sales model and sells through a local distributor instead of online. I spoke to director Kirsten Jelk about building a relationship with a Japanese partner. What is interesting about the Japanese is when they take you on as a business partner, they would see that. They see it more as a very long-term relationship. They'd, and it's the same thing in terms of the way they have their company culture there. When you become an employee in the company, you're actually there for life. That's the premise by which they do business. So once they've chosen you as a business partner, they will actually keep that relationship going for a long time. That's the way we prefer to work too as a company. And would you say that Japan is really unique? It's not like the rest of Asia, it's its own market? I think any Asian market's like that, any Asian country. Mm. They have their own culture, they, have, they actually, their business model is based around those culture. Um, Japan is really about um, loyalty and um, working with ethics, they're very ethical and um, honesty, they're very, very much about that, respect. So the process of actually developing that business relationship could take quite a while before you actually are in a commercial binding agreement. But that basis that you work through to get to that point is a very valuable part of 
dealing with um, the Japanese um, companies. Baoko is South Australia's leading hay producer. Founded in 1990, it started exporting to the Japanese market the following year. Baoko hay is used to feed Japanese dairy cattle. I travelled to the company's hometown of Balaclava and sat down with CEO Rob Lawson to find out what Baoko's learnt about exporting to Japan. One of the things is to never assume, with the, with the Japanese people, never assume that you think you know what they what they look for or the quality that they want. They, they are very um, specific about that. And also with the Japanese people to learn to read that no response or, or uh, how a question is responded to may not necessarily be what they're really saying. They're very polite people. And so I've heard stories of um, some of our sales guys saying, do you like our hay? And the answer will be yes, but then, but that, but yes doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to place an order tomorrow because it might be I've got to work through a number of issues. They're always very respectful of their other business relationships, and so I think the biggest thing for us is to never assume and be prepared to do research and and work alongside them. And to business out there that wants to export to Japan, what would be your, your top three tips? My top three tips would be number one is is to be patient. Uh, number two is to be very transparent and be and be open. And number three is to just trust because um, Japanese people are very honourable. In 25 years, we've never once had an issue with payment. We've never once had an issue of somebody trying to suggest that something wasn't what it was. And so I think it's you shouldn't be fearful uh, when dealing with Japanese people, just be trusting, but just understand that they, they will move through things at their pace. As we've learned on our journey around Tokyo, the Japanese market has plenty to offer but it's a sophisticated place with an eye for detail. Here are my top tips to successfully doing business in Japan. It is a unique, mature market. Your company needs a Japan strategy, not just an Asia strategy. Be punctual. Be polite. Japan is still formal in many business settings. Be diplomatic. Japan is a very indirect, polite, but generous society. Japanese business culture has a strong social element, so be prepared to party. It will help you bond with local partners, and who knows, you might have a great time as well. Head over to our website, theairporteconomist.com, where you can watch extended guest interviews, discover exclusive offers from our partners, and find out where we're flying to next. Well, that's it from Tokyo. See you again on our next business adventure. I'm Tim Harcourt, and I'm The Airport Economist.